Thank you, Amanda. It is an honor and a privilege to moderate this esteemed panel uh, for this amazing Title IX Summit organized by the 19th. When Richard Nixon signed Title IX on June 23rd, 1972, the vast majority of Americans, even those who worked in higher education and even college sports, hadn't realized that not only would this law revolutionize women's access to higher education, it would revolutionize women's opportunities to participate in college sports too. In 1972, women were playing college sports. We, we need to keep that in mind. And they were excelling and they were achieving, but they were doing so with barely any support. They were rocking it at historically black colleges, actually places like Tennessee State and the Tiger Bells were leading US Olympic teams. And it's important to remember that history too. But comparatively, now, 50 years later, we have programs that are nearly comparably funded. We have world-class infrastructure on our college campuses. We have a model that the world looks to and, and tries to emulate. Two in five high school girls play sports for their schools. And we have a ratio of about 45, 55 of athletes playing men's sports and women's sports in the college space. That really matters. There are 220,000 NCAA women athletes this day. That took a lot of work. It took generations of work. It took work on the ground. It took work to, to work against all the resistance and foot dragging. And there's a, there's a tradition and a history of opting into the responsibility of doing that work in women's sports. So we're here to celebrate that today. I'm a historian of American college sports and Title IX, and I love teaching the political, economic, and cultural context in which women's college sports have experienced this rise. But what I really, really love about Title IX is the stories that bring to life this law and what it has meant to American women over the years. Um, all of us seem to have an intimate relationship with Title IX. And so I've asked each of our panelists to share a personal story to capture this relationship with this, this really critical, important law in US history. I asked them to think about generational change over time um, or stories that, that get to and capture what this law means to them personally. So um, Congressman Lori Trahan, let's start with you. What's your Title IX story? Um, well, I guess my, I guess my story, uh, starts with, uh, my grandparents, you know, coming to the United States, uh, my grandmother from Brazil, my grandfather from Portugal, and they, uh, they came just like so many other immigrants did, right? They wanted to create a better life for their family. And so I was born with the dream of going to college, right? That was sort of the, the epitome of uh, building a better future. But, you know, my, my parents didn't have the money to go to college. My father was a union iron worker and my mom, you know, juggled multiple part-time minimum wage jobs while juggling my three sisters and me. And so when college would come up, it was, a, there was a lot of anxiety in our household around the conversation. Um, and I ended up being a first generation college graduate um, because of my volleyball scholarship. Uh, you know, I knew I wanted to go to Georgetown at an early age. Uh, and um, if I, if I hadn't, uh, you know, blessed uh, with the growth spurt <laughs> and with a little bit of talent to play. Uh, I don't know uh, if college would have been in the cards for me. And so uh, that that law transformed my life. It changed the trajectory of my life. And I recognize that um, I probably wouldn't uh, I probably wouldn't have been where I am today uh, if it weren't for Title IX. Dr. Candace Story Lee, let's hear your Title IX story, please. Uh, well, there are, um, there's a lot of things that come to mind, but there's two things that uh, I, I would mention. One, I think about, so I'm 6'3", and I've been 6'3 for a long time. Uh, so I, I was about six feet tall and like nine or 10 years old. And, uh, you know, trying to figure out what to do with all that height. And, um, and my dad had, had asked me to try many, many recreational things, wasn't good at any of them. Finally, we were about to give up. And he said, how about basketball? And there was like a boys league. And I found myself being really cool because I was so much taller. It wasn't good, you know, but all the boys thought I was cool because I was tall and 
it developed into a love of the game. And I just, I mentioned that because, you know, it was uh, much like what Lori is saying that, you know, uh, it really provided a pathway for me. But I also think about my niece who is nine years old and she's now back in my hometown, Madison, Alabama, and she plays basketball too. And it's an all girls league. And there are four teams of these eight and nine year old girls. And I just, uh, I marvel at that because that's like a clear sign of progress. The other thing that comes to mind is I played basketball at Vanderbilt and had a tremendous experience. But the thing that I, I remember um, is that we had all the resources in our basketball program that the men had. You know, it, we were we were equal. There was never any question about commitment. And now as an athletic director, I really rely on that experience. I want to ensure that, um, you know, our student athletes also feel um, that they have equitable access and a high quality experience. Thank you. Co Coach Tori Tyson, let's hear your Title IX story, please. Um, when I think of Title IX, um, I remember being at the University of Nebraska and we made it to a regional. And I mean, everybody, I believe, was watching um, the World Series run right now for college softball on TV. That in itself is just unreal. The fact that they finally stretched our tournament out and it's getting treated like the Mills, um, you know, the baseball World Series and there's rest time. That in itself is just unreal to think of where that tournament started. But I remember being in my junior season and we got sent to the University of Washington. And I was so lucky to get coached by three women who fought Title IX all the time. And Rhonda Ravel, it was a rain delay and they wanted us to play. Um, they didn't want to stretch the tournament out. So they wanted us to pick up a game and it would have taken us all the way into like one in the morning. And at the time, I didn't get it. Rhonda told myself and two other girls that were seniors and in the starting lineup, I want you to go run on the tarp. She told us to dive on the tarp and get soaked. And I'm like, okay. And there's pictures of us. And I didn't realize the power in that moment because what she did was laid a foundation that she wanted us to have an equitable experience and that we deserve the right to have the rest. And they wouldn't have, and she was fighting it, but she did it in such a calm manner that she was, I remember her telling the umpire, you guys would never ask a baseball team to pick up a game at 11 o'clock at night. And there's pictures that still live on of us soaking wet and we're high-fiving. And I didn't even realize the power of that moment. So now when I see these student athletes having this amazing experience in Oklahoma City, I feel a part of it. Um, and I remember that moment and I know that my coaches were setting the bar. So now that I've embarked in my own coaching career, I wanna be a part of the change. Um, and I wanna keep fighting because I was around women that were fighting silently daily. My goodness, I love the physicality of that story, the like running out on the tarp. We, we talk about finding our power in sport and we know what that means, but that is such an illustrative story of what it means to find your power and fighting the power to make sure you get equitable treatment. Um, gosh, I love that story so much. It's reminiscent of the rowing team at Yale that walked into their athletic director's office in the 70s with Title IX written on their stomachs because they were protesting that they didn't have locker room space after they practiced when the men did. And it's those acts that are physical acts, you know, putting it in the face of people that really get the point across. And professional athlete, Brittany Collins, we're, we're using titles with everyone. And, you know, when you go pro in school, you, you become a doctor. And when you go pro in sport, there isn't any title for that, but there should be. So mm -hmm. I'm going to call you pro athlete, Brittany Collins. Can, can we hear your Title IX story, please? Yeah, thank you for sure. These are all incredible stories. And just, just by hearing them are like triggering a bunch of different things in my head, which is so cool, because I think at the same time, it's kind of a small world. And it was really interest, like interesting for me how I kind of got introduced to Title IX because I knew of it kind of going into school. Like I knew just like, okay, there's a certain amount of scholarships for girls because of guys, but I'm going to be honest, like I wasn't really educated on it because it wasn't something I was talking about in high school. But when I showed up, when I transferred and showed up to UMass, it was completely different because my coach was a Title IX pioneer. 
I believe she was the first woman to sue, sue and win a case for Title IX against Yale. I don't remember the decade it was in, but it was a little bit ago. And um, immediately the first thing we did before we practiced, before we got uniforms, before we did anything, we had a team meeting and we talked about Title IX and how our coach Judy kind of played a role in, you know, what our team should embody and resemble as, as women and what we're entitled to, to men. And so one of the craziest stories Speaking of Yale, she told uh, told us was that she was the coach and they had one, I think one practice court and the men had three and the men were coming over into the women's practice court to kick them off, even though they had already had like double the time. And the men's coach told the, the guys team to serve at my coach's back, which is if you know how hard men hit the ball, that is so dangerous and so scary. And so this is kind of the stories that we were kind of told because generationally, if she's going to stand up and leave her mark, then as a team, we wanted to do the same thing. So we were, it was always in, in our team's mind that title nine is so important and people have fought for this. So we need to do the same thing. Oh my goodness. I mean, these stories of what we learn from the people who came before us and how we think about how we can continue that progress and that path or continue to protect what we know we deserve is so valuable. Um, the woman whose papers I used to write my dissertation worked at the University of North Carolina from World War II until the early 90s. And her, her name was Frances Hogan. And she was the tennis coach for many of those decades. And um, going through her papers and finding these stories, it really brings to life the everyday battles <laughs> Um, and we have these kind of high water marks and moments, but she in those papers told the story of having to lock the courts and recommending that other coaches lock the courts behind them when they get in so that they aren't invaded by men who feel they have the right to the playing space. And, you know, that's why the folks who put these laws <laughs> into practice, the, the workers in the Department of Health, Education and Welfare who like sat down and wrote out the regulations, let's put law into practice and show what this looks like on the ground, why their work was so valuable and crucial to what this meant in a collegiate athletic space. Thank you all of you for sharing these stories. Man, this is gonna make me excited for <laughs> the rest of the month of June and onward from there. Um, so, you know, we could have a million different conversations about Title IX and there's a million different things I love about Title IX. Um, but the thing I love the most is that the law serves as a reminder that college sports are educational programs and activities. We've already been talking about all the learning that goes on in sporting spaces, um, especially for girls and women and, and feeling powerful and having the right to have <laughs> certain programs and activities and experiences and opportunities. Um, we can talk about the law as written. Um, you know, that language, those 37 words are about preventing discrimination. But what I like to do in the classroom when I'm teaching about Title IX is to flip it into a positive. We can talk about the law, what the law is. This is an educational civil rights law. And we can talk about what the law means. In the context of sports, schools must provide the equal opportunity to play school sports. So it's a project. It's conveying the idea that this is a project that we need to keep working to create and expand and protect opportunities and that they're educational opportunities. That's what makes this law so wonderful in the context of the world that we define school sports as educational and the right to play school sports as a civil right. It's massively important. Um, so what I want to ask all of you is what do students learn about themselves and each other when they play sports, actually playing sports themselves? And why might these educational opportunities be especially important for young girls and women? What have you learned about yourself and your teammates and what lessons have you carried forward? And Coach Tyson, let's start with you since you're, you're the one really working on a daily basis with these young people. Um, I think when I think of myself, um, I'm a single mom in sports, which is like unheard of. And I'm so grateful that I played sports because I genuinely find myself on the, 
on my most like the struggle days. So grateful that at one point in my life, I had to manage being a student and an athlete um, and trying to thrive and be both. Um, I am grateful that I was able to find my voice as I fight battles every day, um, especially at an HBCU level to make it equitable for my athletes. Um, I'm so grateful for sport that I went and had the opportunity to go to a Midwest state. I was a California girl um, and I had to figure out how to find my voice and um, make myself seen and heard in a lot of rooms that I wouldn't have been in if it wasn't for sport. And I'm so grateful for that. And when I think of the student athletes that I have the ability to motivate, um, I think of how they come from so many different backgrounds. And for me, I don't think that sport is where you should find your identity because you can't find identity in results. But I do think you can find identity in like joining this tribe of women and coming out the best version of yourself because of your experiences with them. Um, and it's something that I now get to implement. And I understand that like, it is my job and my duty because I had a woman that helped shape me. It is my job to help shape them so that they're prepared to stand tall in every room that they walk in. And I truly believe sports a lot. It, it gives us a platform to do that. Um, and I'm grateful that women get to be in charge to help train the next generation of women. And um, we have a right and a duty to do that. Um, and so I'm super grateful. It, it, again, it gives us voice. Um, it gives us a sense of purpose and all things you kind of need as a parent, as a boss, as a CEO. Um, it just gives us lessons that carry carry with us everywhere. And these experiences, my nine-year-old went with us to our regional at Florida State. And to see the growth of our sport, they were treating us like first-class citizens. And so she thinks like, well, I'm going to go to the WNBA now. Like, I'm going to be a professional athlete because you guys got treated like a professional athlete. Um, and we were chartering. She got to be on the jet with us. Um, and again, that would not have happened years ago. So our growth, Howard University softball team was on a private jet um, back to DC. And to see that and my daughter get to witness it um, it's impacting the future, and I'm super grateful sport has done that. My daughter feels like there is no ceiling, um, and that, that is an amazing feeling. What's your daughter's name? Skylar Hope. Okay, Skylar Hope. Okay, that's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> of course. Dr. Lee, I um, am so impressed by the culture at Vanderbilt Athletics, um, and you were talking about the lessons that athletes learn direct, directly from playing their sports. But I feel like your athletic department has really set a model for kind of weaving in education off the field education and on the field education and, and that we're not treating those things as binaries, but that this learning takes place kind of cohesively. Can you talk a little bit about the culture at your athletic department and the amazing things related to um, thinking of Title IX as an educational civil rights law? Well, I, I really appreciate what you said. I'm glad that that's a perception. That's certainly what we're trying to do. And, um, you know, I would say that I, I agree wholeheartedly with what Coach Tyson said and thinking about, um, you know, I, uh, as a student athlete, you know, we're trying to focus on providing the most, uh, a holistic student athlete experience to our young people. And knowing that, I like how you said that, um, that, um, you know, the sport, like wherever they play their, their sport, it is an extension of the, the full experience and it, it's an extension of the classroom. You know, I think about our coaches as educators. So, uh, I mean, some of them have <laughs> academic credentials, but it's like, even if they're not academicians, they are truly educators. And I think that sports just provides, you know, what I think about as a leader, I think about being a good teammate. And I learned that from playing sports. You know, I, you have to be able to work alongside and be a good follower in order to be a good leader, you know, and, and sports will do that for you. I think about the humility of, you know, when you're uh, an elite athlete like Brittany, like you think all you have to do is prepare, you're going to win, right? You're physically prepared, you're mentally tough, you are supposed to win. And sometimes you can do everything perfectly and you still don't win. Yep. And it can be so humbling, <laughs> You know, it, you know, defeat can be humbling, but the great thing about sport is that you get to come back. You get another opportunity. And our coach used to say all the time, like, um, you know, basically just because you make a bad play, don't now turn the ball over three times, but you got to forget it. You got to forget it and you got to turn around and be whatever your team needs you to be. And there's just, there's so much power in, in sports, you know? So what we try to do at Vanderbilt, and I know people are doing all over the country is trying to uh, 
leverage those lessons so that these student athletes, including our young women, feel empowered to take that and apply that so they can reach their potential in whatever space they're in. So you know, I consider that the most important part of my job. Congresswoman Trahan, can we hear about your pathway to where you are today and the role that sport maybe has played in that, you know, with Dr. Lee talking about lessons of, of winning and also losing and how hard it can be to make yourself kind of take opt in to doing something so vulnerable as running for office. I imagine sports played a role in that. <laughs> oh, well, it certainly, it certainly came in handy. And uh, look, I loved, um, um, listening to coach Tyson and Dr. Lee, uh, because it is markedly different today than it was when we were playing sports. Um, you know, I think about what my daughters are seeing as opposed to what I saw and that so much matters, right? I don't think my daughters are ever going to see, uh, or not see a woman running for president, right? I don't think she's ever not going to see, you know, uh, women's sports on, on TV. And we've got a lot more work to do and we could talk about that later, but the optics matter. Um, and I can't, even, I can't even emphasize enough how crucial um, playing sports was to just the latest thing I did, which was running for Congress. Um, you do have to understand defeat, uh, what to do when you lose, right? How you reflect on how you get better. Um, the discipline of sticking with something, of practicing, uh, you know, learn by doing, right? I mean, all of those skills that I didn't even have a, um, an appreciation for while I was doing it as a young woman. Uh, I just did it because I wanted to win. I wanted to get a scholarship. I wanted to keep playing. I loved my team. I didn't want to let them down. And then lo and behold, um, I'm in the private sector, you know, leading a sales team and everything that I'm doing there is about, <laughs> is like, you know, drawing on the, the skills and the, um, you know, uh, the the practice and the uh, of of playing sports and then you know winning a campaign to Congress those require much different skills than actually being a legislator but they both kind of tapped into everything I learned about sports one how to win and and get better as I go and to do things that are uncomfortable uh, and to be coachable <laughs> but then also to work as a team right I mean you can't heart you can't but I think uh, Dr. Lee said it best you can't make um, you know you can't hold on to things uh, to setbacks you you have to figure out a way to to get back in the game and to make the next play and you know i'm i work with republicans a lot because i don't feel the setbacks as deeply or as emotionally um as as i would if maybe i didn't play sports and so i think everything that i've done and everything that i do just in my daily life i could trace back to something i've done on the court um, and, uh, and I think that's the power that I want to teach my own daughters, um, which is really exciting, um, but that I also want to make better um, for them in terms of finally getting to this point where we are living up to Title IX in this 50th anniversary year. Um, professional athlete, Brittany Collins, I think um, there's such a good opportunity um, to talk about something more specific with your career, and that is kind of what the transition from playing college sports to professional sports both reveals about <laughs> the structures we have in place in the American collegiate system, which, you know, in tennis is so very international, too. I was reading an amazing piece you wrote recently for Global Sport Matters um, about just how challenging that transition is, but also the kind of international makeup of your team when you were a collegian. Um, and then also, you know, now that you're playing, I mean, I, I know that you're in San Diego right now, but we could very well have been having this conversation with you in Brazil or Tunisia or somewhere else where you kind of pick up and go. And I think um, your experiences give an opportunity to reflect on you know, the excellent structures we do really have in place in American college sports, but also um, how that those structures kind of disappear and athletes aren't necessarily prepared for them. And the, then what you can do, um, resiliency is a word that I think kind of masks a lot of different skills, <laughs> um, but the skills that you learned as a college athlete, you're now able to adapt and, and 
navigate what is a very challenging place because of those college experiences. I don't mean to speak for you, but I sense that that's a lot of what's going on here. So can you share a little bit about that with us? Yeah, that was perfect. Cause that's exactly kind of <laughs> in my head when I'm, I'm, I'm listening to all, all you guys speak. I'm like, you know, I'm, I want to echo all these things because they all intertwine. And for me, tennis is kind of like a weird thing. So title nine is really important to tennis teams. Cause if we think about it, you know, these are the teams that usually get cut because we're not bringing in revenue. We're not like tons of fans aren't coming. And so without Title IX, I would have missed out on so many educational experiences. We have an incredibly international sport. So one of the biggest things I learned was learning how to cooperate with people from different cultures, which is incredibly difficult and not something as an American that I had the chance to have growing up. And so that just fundamental of learning to work together, learning to communicate, um, having an open mind really transformed me in the ability that I later would come to realize that, oh my God, the structure of my life has completely changed. I'm now having to be resourceful and I'm going to have to work with people that don't have the same beliefs as me, um, but we need to get to the same kind of common goal. And so that, and just thinking of my teammates, you know, those lessons we learned and being, you know, with, with Title IX, I think being independent, you know, being a strong woman, uh, working together, those transform for me, but also for my friends who now we talk about all the time, like they're in the workforce and, you know, whatever career path you go down, being able to represent yourself well, stand up and be resourceful is so important. So um, yeah, the struggles on professional tennis tour and the entry stages have been very difficult, but I think mentally I've been able to be a lot more resilient and just you know, I do miss things that were in place, like people, you know, helping me out with scheduling and all that kind of stuff. But just, just having the kind of, I would say experiences through having an international team really prepared me well. And I can see how that might be different from other people on tour that just never either went to college and just went straight on the tour. And they're kind of like individualized people because tennis is a very individualized sport. And that whole team dynamic just, I think really helps me out majorly. Oh, I love that. And I, I love pointing out that all these individual sports in the college space, we turn them in the team sports. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I won a national championship because my teammate, Jackie Johnson was so good at what she did. She like lifted up our whole program to inspire us to also win national championships. And we won a team title and like the men even won a team title because Jackie Johnson was so good. So Jackie Johnson, I like to tell everyone at Arizona State University is our GOAT. She is the athlete. Everyone at ASU should say that's the best athlete we've had as a Sun Devil. This all segues really nicely into a discussion about how your experiences playing sports have helped prepare you for the leadership and service roles you hold today. If there are public servants and civil actors and civically responsible people, they are often people who played women's college sports. <laughs> Um, and so in all of your positions today, we have all sorts of sectors of, of work and sport represented here. Um, you know, using your platform for the change you want to see in college sports in the world. Um, something I, I always am sure to discuss when I meet with college athletes is that we all hold the opportunity to say yes and opt in to doing the work to make our sports and society better to ensure that we eventually leave our sports or organizations in a better place than what they had been when we had arrived and to protect the progress that had been made by our predecessors. Coach Tyson, the story you told about, you know, the lessons you learned from your coach and you're now implementing really get to that. It's this like taking of the baton, acknowledging and opting into the responsibility of doing this work. And this mission then of course transcends college sports and transcends sports. We see women who've played college sports going on to make change in all sorts of ways in the world. Um, in the sporting space, this historic collective bargaining agreement we saw with US soccer and the US women's national team and the US men's national team really provides a model for inspiration and aspiration globally. You know, they're taking on FIFA next and equalizing prize money in that space. And so I think the power of sport for change, both within sporting institutions and within broader society is one of the, the foremost legacies of Title IX and women who've come through college sports. You four really showcase this. And before, we're, we're not wrapping yet, but I wanna stop for a second and thank you. Um, this work 
is a lot. And I'm so appreciative of the work that you do in your respective roles. Um, so thank you for embracing doing this work um, and, and taking on and saying yes to these leadership responsibilities in your latest roles. So I'm interested to hear about projects you're most excited about that you're working on today and how have your sporting experiences set you up to do this work. And um, Congresswoman Trahan, if we could start with you both, you know, I know you're involved in college sports advocacy and, and reform there, but in the sporting space and beyond too, please. Yeah, so um, I loved what you said at the beginning. I think it's interesting that time and time again, uh, women athletes have been, you know, underfunded, undersupported, uh, sometimes even left to fend for themselves, yet we've exceeded in spite of that. And I think the women on this panel are proof of that. Uh, and I think that's the approach I've always carried with me since my playing days. You know, it fueled me when I, when I worked as a public servant just after college, uh, working my way up to chief of staff to a congressman. Uh, it informed my decision making as the only female executive at a tech company. Um, it's the reason I helped co-found and run a consulting firm that worked with some of the largest companies around the world to elevate women into leadership positions in the workplace. And, and it truly is the foundation on which I built my approach to legislating. So, so much of what I work on is built around ways to create better outcomes for women uh, to succeed. Because you know I truly believe that uh, when women have a voice at the decision-making table, um, one, we make better decisions and we achieve just better outcomes, right? And that's why I've been focusing on getting working moms who had to leave their jobs during the pandemic back into the workforce, um, all the way to working with Senator Murphy on legislation pertaining to college rights, right? Impacts on women athletes are always my first thought. And uh, together we introduced two bills along those lines. We, the first is the College Athlete Economic Freedom Act, which creates a national standard to ensure that um, athletes can benefit from their name, image, and likeness. Uh, and uh, the second bill is the College Right to Organize Act, which would allow athletes to join together to advocate for things like training facilities and health services. And of course, you know, advocating for any sort of positive change in today's political climate has its challenges, but that's where being an athlete has prepared me uh, to put in the work to get it done. So um, it's, uh, it really is about making sure that we make it better for the future generations. And I think uh, um, there is a really cool conversation right now that is happening um, that wasn't uh, that wasn't happening when when I was playing. And I think that's going to bode well for women because uh, women's sports are the growth of sports, right? I mean, we see it today. We see the surge in attendance and following. Um, I know my kids are super jazzed by what they see. And so when you think of how that's going to, um, um, you know, sort of maintain the growth and the interest in college sports, I think women are where it's at. And so we want to make sure that the conditions are set for women to thrive, uh, which is why we've spent some time with some with some pretty exciting legislative proposals in that regard. Brittany, I know you have to literally run off to a tennis tournament. Um, so I want to pivot to you really quickly before you hop off to do that. Um, you, I know, have been engaged in much of the advocacy that Congresswoman Trahan was just talking about. Um, and so you're now using your platform and your voice and learning from your experiences to advocate for the change you'd like to see in the collegiate space. Can you can you talk about those efforts and maybe what had happened to you <laughs> to stimulate <laughs> that? <laughs> yeah, um, I will. Yes, yeah, sorry, sorry that I have to run soon. Um, I'm actually enjoying this conversation so much. This is, I always <laughs> say like as, as educational as this may be for anybody else, it's actually most educational for myself just from hearing from other people. So I really appreciate that. And um, yeah, just by a weird accident to sum it up, um, I ended up losing my career and my teammates. Uh, we had an A-10 championship title in 2017. All of that is gone now because of amateurism. I say amateurism with quotes, rules, um, that the NCAA kind of came down on us because somebody made a clerical error for $252. And it ended up kind of sparking this kind of actually oddly national and sometimes international rage because it was 
there were so many issues with it from the fact that you don't see men's teams, you know, with a lot doing a lot worse things, getting in trouble. And just by the fact that athletes were getting punished for something that they had nothing to do with. And so, um, I just was like, so dumbfounded by the fact that my career was gone for something I had nothing to do with three years after graduating school and, and, and an event that was so important to myself and teammates that I wrote this petition and it kind of circulated around and I didn't even know there was like a college athletes advocacy world. And that really inspired me to jump into the conversation and get as involved as I possibly could, because during my time at college, I experienced a lot of different things that were very difficult uh, for me and for my teammates. And I just recognized was not right. Um, and that college athletes shouldn't have to endure these kinds of things. And so when I learned that there was a space that I could get involved in and speak up to any degree that anybody would listen, I wanted to do that because I, I wanted to show other athletes that they can also do that. And that that is the upside to social media and social media platforms. And so um, I have my feet or my eggs in a lot of different baskets. Um, you know, I've been working with Senator Murphy, Senator Brooker, Congresswoman, uh, Congresswoman Trahan, like on all these important issues from, you know, I think for me, the most important things are physical um, and mental health um, for athletes, but they're all interrelated. So I also tried really hard to work on the Massachusetts NIL um, bill just to make sure that, you know, if we can provide some economic safety, then that will trickle into a later on like physical, mental, all these things. And so um, I'm a little bit all over the place because I never want to say no. Um, and so that's why it's so great to be on a conversation like today. But um, I just think it's really important to take these opportunities because you don't know what you know, what life that you're inspiring in a college athlete to speak out against. And so uh, against, you know, problematic behaviors in college. So um, I've been really lucky to do so thus far. And I just hope that I can continue having important conversations like these so that other athletes feel like they, they are entitled to do the same thing. That work, Brittany, and sharing it with us. And if you need yeah, to hop off, really fast. Not, because, not, not because I have to go, but because I'm so that nervous. Impressive. <laughs> that was so impressive. Such an impressive <laughs> summary. I'd like to close with, with our two people who work most directly in intercollegiate athletics, Dr. Lee and Coach Tyson. Um, thank you so much for doing the work that you do in this space. Um, we've been hearing a lot of conversations in this space right now about burnout. And I know um, people were burnt out before the pandemic and intercollegiate athletics. And the last two years have just been really hard to support and serve our students who play sports. Um, and, and just so many incredible challenges, the, the racial reckoning after the murder of George Floyd and the way athletes have been engaged and wanting to talk about that and the toll it's taken, especially on black athletes and intercollegiate athletics as well. Um, I, I want to thank you <laughs> for that work that you do that is, is enriching and exhausting um, and acknowledge all of that work. I also am curious, um, since we're, a lot of our conversation has been kind of future focused and generational change oriented, if there's something you wanna see in the future or what wisdom you could share with this next generation of athletes coming up, Coach Tyson, you see it every day, I'm sure with your daughter, um, but what would you say to this next generation? How, how do they take the baton and, and continue this work? But, but you know, what hope do we have for the future in women's college sports? Um, well, one, I think the representation and continuing to get it out there and training them on how to use their platform and their voice. And I think something Brittany alluded to is that there's so much like lack of education on um, just this topic. And how do you, that one, that they have a right to an equitable experience. And that is something that I think we have to educate. Um, my daughter went at a young age, right? Like she watches me fight battles daily. And I love that um, because she's going to know that one that is owed to her um, and she's allowed to. You wouldn't believe how many young student athletes like I run into or that even at the high school level that don't realize that they have a right to an equitable experience or even how to argue it um, and to do that. And I think that I'm in a very unique experience that we often feel like we have to battle by um, like as a coach, right? Like leveraging a job. Um, somebody has to be able to stay and show how to fight a daily battle um, with 
cat. And I think that that is something that I've really tried to thrust myself into. Um, and again, that experience forever changed me and we're fighting for facilities, right? The right. And so it's tough because you hear that if you don't have like a, we don't have a baseball team. So then what do you do there? Like, there's nothing to compare it to, but it is, you have to let yourself be seen. So when we struggle, we have facility issues here. I have us go practice right in front of the gym and they're watching us get after it and they have to see us. Um, and again, it shouldn't always be that. I, I think that we have to make ourselves be seen. So it's not like you have to complain. I want them to see it and feel it. Um, we shouldn't always have to go and cause a rage on a social media um, for that to happen. And so I want them to know, um, let yourself be seen and you are allowed to fight for an equitable experience. Um, and I, again, I'm, I think this next generation, Skylar's age group, they're gonna know. I'm like excited for them. And um, I think that we just have to empower that. I have to let it be okay for her to use her voice, um, to let it be okay for her to see me using mine and my my athletes. Um, I have her sit in on my conversations when we do have these, there are certain things that come up and I'm gonna let, I let my team know we're gonna do this and we're gonna handle it this way for this next generation. Um, so I think it's just empowering and empowering, encouraging, but most importantly, educating them that they have the right to these experiences and how to go about it. Um, so I think Brittany's story is so cool because so many athletes and just young women in sports in general have no idea how to go about this or that they have the right to go about certain things. So I'm super excited to continue just to be an educator and do my part in that. Thank you, Coach Tyson. That's inspiring. <laughs> Um, Dr. Lee, with the, the last minute we have left, and I'm sorry for the hard stop, um, can, can you tell us your thoughts for the future? I, I just want to <laughs> say, <laughs> like, everything was so cool today. So I was, I'm so glad to, to, to be a part of it. It was so enriching. And I would say that um, every woman on here showed that, like, within our own realms, we can make an impact. Right. So like you cannot do everything, but there is something that you are uniquely positioned to to affect. And if we can do that for each other, um, especially in the spaces that were not carved out for us, which we all know about those spaces, because that's most spaces, then I mean, what an impact we can have. So, I mean, what a it's a real privilege. So. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you to our esteemed panelists. Thank you, Faith Smith, Marissa Nelson, Amanda, and everyone at the 19. This is an incredible program you've put together. And thank you to the audience for, for learning with us. Creating, expanding, and protecting inclusive participation opportunities in school sports takes ever-present work. And I hope this conversation has served as inspiration to opt in and say yes to that civic responsibility. Thank you.